Hi, I'm Beth Comstock. I sat down today with Dr. Adam Ghazali, who's leading amazing research that connects video gaming, neuroscience, and the future of the brain. This is the future in five. Dr. Ghazali, why don't you tell us your story? What, what, what's your story? Sure, okay. Well, let's see. I'll tell you one of the stories. Um, so I'm a professor of neuroscience here at UCSF. I'm in the neurology, psychiatry, physiology department. And I'm the executive director of a new center called Neuroscape. I'm trained as a neurologist and as a neuroscientist. I'm an MD, PhD. And for many years, my research was trying to figure out how the brain works, how it goes wrong uh, when we get older, when we're exposed to too much distraction. And over the last, uh, I guess, eight years now, we've been more interested in not just understanding the brain, but trying to figure out if we could develop approaches to improve the brain. You could have a very traumatic experience in the real world, a vi you know, just visualize it, not actually a physical accident, and have post-traumatic stress disorder that negatively impacts your brain. So how do you create a positive experience to improve the brain? So my idea was to build a video game, since we know that video games through you know, their interactivity and their fun and their engagement engagement are powerful influences of behavior anyway, but if we could design it with an understanding of neuroscience and understanding what we want to improve and then build these very adaptive algorithms so that the game is always putting pressure on that system, we could optimize it. So in your case, I'd come to you and you'd write me a prescription to actually go play a game? That's what you're telling, that's what you're having your patients do, is to go and prescribe them a game? That's the that's the vision, that's the dream. You know, where we've advanced with that is that we now have a full phase three clinical multi-site trial for approval of our video game uh, that came from NeuroRacer now called EVO for treatment of ADHD. Yeah, so remarkable. kids with ADHD. So the idea is that a doctor will pull out a prescription pad and say, okay, you know, two months video game play, iPad this, and just like they would a drug. So you also are very entrepreneurial. That's what I love about your story. I mean, do you consider yourself more a neuroscientist, an entrepreneur, do you merge them up? And what does it mean to be entrepreneurial in this space? I mean, I do both. So I've started a company. I helped start a, started a venture fund to fund other companies that are doing this type of work. Um, but my main job is a professor and a director of an academic research center. I, I feel pretty strongly that we can't just live in a silo around academics if we really want to have positive influence and impact on people's lives. We need to figure out how to unite industry and academics. And so that's why I've been driven to do it. So you wrote a book last year called The Distracted Mind. And I was really disappointed to find out one of your one of your findings or one of the things you say in the book is you actually can't multitask. And I'm really yeah, heartbroken by that because I'm so convinced sad. I'm going to prove that <laughs> wrong. But no, I can't multitask. What were some of the insights in the distracted mind and how might we think about that at work? Yeah, so the distracted mind, ancient brains in a high tech world is the subtitle, really grew out of my research right up until I started doing my video game work to improve the brain. And what we show through extensive research, both from our lab and many others around the world, is that interference, either distraction from completely irrelevant information that just gets through your filter, like having that conversation at a restaurant or, or multitasking when you're engaged in a conversation and you pull out your phone. So when my boss tells me to put my phone away, he really is onto something? So if you are engaged in more than one task that both demand your attention. I mean, there's plenty of things we could multitask if you consider chewing gum a task. But generally, tasks are defined as something that demands attention. With that definition, if you engage in both of them at the same time, the brain networks that are activated to focus your limited resources on one of them have to switch to the other task and then switch back again. And with each switch, there's a cost and a performance decrement. So how have you changed how you work based on your research and what advice would you give to people like me and my colleagues? Yeah. What are a couple things we should be doing to not be so distracted? Yeah, so usually I, I say the first piece of advice is awareness. But as we know, and we could see this with smoking and with sun exposure, awareness is not enough in itself, it's a start. Um, and then, uh, so once you are aware, once you are motivated to change because you recognize the impact is negative, then um, usually what I say is that you need to restructure your environment based on where you know your weaknesses lies. It doesn't mean that multitasking or technology is bad, you know, far from it. There's many things that are offered by tech that are amazing. When you know you want to do one thing, and the work example is an easy description, you know, I say, okay, from 10 to 11, I'm, you know, I put it on my calendar, I'm going to work focus, on this paper. Focus. Quit my email, quit my, you know, my browser from not using it, don't go on Facebook, 
don't text, close my door, even turn my phone to airplane mode if I'm having trouble, and just really focus and learn how to focus again. It's like a, a trained yeah. skill. It's good, good advice. Exactly. So this is your brain? Yes. Someone 3D printed yes, this for you? Yes, my lab gave it to me this, as a gift for our 10 year anniversary. Did you ever think when you were growing up you'd be able to look at your brain not, in not this way? Not in this way, no. What it, did you want to be when you were growing up? Well, when I was little, I wanted to be a scientist. Um, and I don't really fully understand why. Something just got under my skin about it since I was like seven years old. If someone said, what do you want to be? And I didn't know any scientists at all, um, or even any doctors at that point. I would say, I want to be a scientist. And, and then it was reinforced through science fiction and watching Carl Sagan's Cosmos series. Yeah. And then I wanted to be an astronomer. It was all, to me, it was all about space. And it wasn't until I was in college that I discovered this space, this inner space, and then after that, Never look well, back. this may be the most interesting space of all, right? I mean, it's, I think so. it's uh, and we've just begun, right? That's what's so exciting. The complexity is overwhelming. The more you know about it, the more humbling it is yeah. to study the brain. Amazing. Um, but, you know, it's us. It's like the core of our identity. So unlike space, which is fascinating but feels out there, this feels, you know, closer to us than anything we know. So and Here I have your brain in yeah, my hands. Yeah, I know. It's <laughs> well, Dr. Adam Ghazali, thank <laughs> you very much. Nice meeting. Thanks. Thanks.